Let me tell you a story about a girl named Debbie who loved her stuffed doll, dog, and little Miss Muffet. She was always dressing her up, sometimes just for fun. For her fun, not Muffet's. But when Debbie found a strange book on her shelf, an incredible thing happened. <gasps> dog, you're alive! Oh, goody. Where are we, dog? Welcome back to the Advent Calendar House for today's very wound up and thrown out into a pile of junk into another dimension episode, covering the 1988 Nickelodeon special Christmas in Tattertown. Tattertown! 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 I am discarded child's plaything Mike Westfall, and joining me for this forgotten stuffed creature of a special is smooth-talking saxophone who finally put on those sunglasses that make him see the world around him for what it truly is. It's Chad Young from the horror movie Barbecue. Hello, Chad. Not this year. (laughs) (laughs) I I know what a big uh, They Live audience you have, so... Figure it's, I cater to them. <laughs> I figured it's one to one. It's just a big, the Venn diagram's just a big old circle. Oh, yeah, absolutely. All right. So I think this might have been your suggestion. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> I, I'm sorry in advance. That's, that's fine. Do you remember <laughs> watching this when it first aired? I, well, that's the funny thing is I, I, bef- when I had suggested it to you, I think it was probably a couple months ago, right? Because we were kind of, bouncing ideas off of each other Mm -hmm. you know to kind of uh to we hadn't done a podcast in a while we were kind of just bouncing ideas off each other um and i think we were talking about doing cartoon all-stars to the rescue at one point and then i was just like have you ever seen that christmas in tattertown and you were like no no Um, i've seen it i remember oh you've seen it i have seen it it just had been a while and here i thought i had seen it on opening night but i definitely did not because right it first aired December 21st, 1988, and I was busy watching the Pee-wee's Playhouse Christmas special. a boy. Yeah, I think we all were, let's be fair. Yeah. Um, I don't think I watched it opening, you know, uh, opening night. Look, look at what you're making me talk like. Okay. Um, <laughs> no, I don't think I watched it uh, the night it premiered. I think I probably caught like a few bits and pieces of it down the road, because there are certain things that I kind of... It, it kind of hit me that I remember, but um, I mean, I'm a huge Ralph Bakshi fan, mm-hmm. and like this was always just one that I I knew the the name, but I, I don't I don't think I had ever seen it all the way through. So okay, as I was watching it, I remember I had to have seen this mm-hmm. at some point. I don't know whether they ran it again later in the week or just the few years following. 1988, so perhaps that's when I caught it. This was one of the Mm. few specials I remember, but did not have on tape. It never made it onto the VHS cassette. And there's a very good reason for it. (laughs) (laughs) Jingle Bell Rap got a uh, a, uh, VHS release, and this didn't, by the way. Just want to point that out. Yeah, this doesn't have any kind of home media. Well, Ralph Uh actually owns the rights to it, so... And that could be an issue onto itself because Ralph Bakshi isn't always the easiest human being to deal with in terms of uh, of um, sharing. Oh, is <laughs> so, that? I mean, I, 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 I mean, I don't know the guy very well or at all. But I mean, from the things I've read, the interviews and all, he kind of likes doing things on his terms. So I can kind of see him, you know, just not being satisfied with any company, you know, or. I don't know. I, I, I don't know the reason why it hasn't gotten a release, but I do find it odd that out of everything Bakshi has done, you know, this is one of the few things that has never gotten a home release. It might have something to do with the fact that this is clearly supposed to be a pilot episode of a series that was proposed to yeah. Nickelodeon that just mm-hmm. never made it as a series. This, I... Right. Did not realize until very recently, Christmas in Tattertown was the first original animated anything ever made for Nickelodeon specifically that actually made it to the air. I didn't know that. I feel like that's something I knew. um, But again, maybe it's just it's been a long time 
Okay. So, but you know, I and I mean, I think that you know, as as time goes on, you'll kind of see the Bakshi influence mm-hmm. uh, on Nickelodeon oh, big yeah. time, even though he doesn't have a lot to do with other pro. You know, he didn't have anything to do with other projects. Uh, you can totally see that in this, you know, this pilot alone, Nickelodeon was very uh they they were trying to be different and stand out and kind of make their name and yeah i think going to back she was a good idea oh yeah uh, I, I, because he was established i mean they could have gone to like don bluth they could have gone to you know pretty much anyone but they went to a guy that you know knows what he's doing don unfortunately bluth was very busy in 1988 so they probably couldn't have gotten don bluth oh was this the year of uh land before time i and, think so um, what was um, uh, American Tale? American Tale was 86, I think. Okay, thank you. Okay, perfect. Um, oh, then, yeah, okay, I guess. Yeah, yeah but, you, you might have a point. Yeah, but shout out to my pal Greg for pointing that out to me, that this is the first real Nickelodeon original cartoon. They imported a lot, obviously, but it seems sure. crazy to me. Canadian, a lot of Canadian A lot stuff. of Canadian, a lot of overseas yeah. that made it into pinwheel, but... Oh, jeez. Yeah. You know... Um, when, uh, TPIF came back, we kind of talked about, you know, just how much they imported from Canada and, you know, especially in the early days. And my co-host Derek hates pinwheel, hates pinwheel. Really? Yes. He hated it. <laughs> what did he hate and you about guys are pinwheel? Gonna... Well, there's a lot to hate about pinwheel, but what specifically you know what? did he hate about pinwheel? Well, you're going to have to listen to that. Or I think you already have listened to this episode. Dude, by now, by the time by now. this year. <laughs> Happy yeah. Back to the Future Day. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> but, um, but yes, Derek's not a fan. <laughs> okay. Well, again, thank you to my buddy Greg for pointing that out. He does this incredible YouTube series called Knickknacks that I'm shouting oh. out here. It's a very thorough history of Nickelodeon uh, from the very oh. beginning. So go check that out. I'm going to have to check. Oh, oh fantastic. Oh, yeah. Yes, very obviously directed by Ralph Bakshi. Besides very. this, what's the first thing you think of when you think of Ralph Bakshi? Um, you know, it, I, it should probably be Fritz the Cat, but <laughs> my mind goes directly to uh, Heavy Traffic and really? Goonskin. Okay. Yep. My two favorite uh, things he's ever done. Um, have you ever seen uh, Heavy Traffic? That one I haven't seen. I was going to say Cool World, which is obviously, I feel like... What he wanted to keep from this special made yes. it into Cool yes. World. Absolutely. And we'll talk Absolutely. in more detail about that later. But Yeah. Well, let me just let me just say, uh, Heavy Traffic, I'm not going to tell you what, but there's a <laughs> sequence in the end that is one of the most mind-blowing and beautiful animated sequences I have ever seen in my entire life. And for the budget he has, I mean, I think it's safe to say Everyone knows Ralph Bakshi likes to be uh, frugal with his uh, budget, <laughs> and uh, the 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 effect that or the the sequence he pulled off in Heavy Traffic, I, uh, my, I, it just it it still blows my mind. I think it's just insane and just oh so beautiful, and it's a great movie too. I, I definitely suggest checking it out. We'll have to check it out. Like I, my oh. first Ralph Bakshi joint was Mighty Mouse, The New Adventures, mm-hmm. which I really liked yes. at the time. So I think that this special caught my eye because it had that same early animation throwback style that Mighty Mouse did. So mm-hmm. this became a must-watch for me mm-hmm. whenever it aired, when it, they weren't airing it against Pee Wee. Come on. <sighs> what What are you thinking? Come they on, tried. Guys. Come on. They tried. Um. So here's my question. Is... Um, I, I mean, I watched that new Mighty Mouse series, and it mm-hmm. kind of introduced me to who Mighty Mouse was. Yeah. Did you end up? And this is kind of a weird one, but well, look at the show we're we're <laughs> we're doing. Um, did you ever end up going to Wendy's for the Mighty Mouse uh, fast food promotion, the kids meal thing? No, I was not a Wendy's kid at all. I had a McDonald's and a Burger King across the street from each other, very close to me. But Wendy's wasn't in that mix. There was a Taco Bell. There was a Checkers. Mm-hmm. I don't remember oh, there being a Wendy's. Checkers. Now, oh, now let's oh, – those fries from Checkers, I could just go on and on. <laughs> but honestly, I wasn't a Wendy's kid until probably I got older. 
Okay. So I, I yeah, get same. it, but my dad was a huge fast food uh, lover, like especially hard. I, I've talked about it many times before. Mm-hmm. Hardee's and Roy's were his favorite. Like McDonald's didn't really even get the consideration a lot of time. Wow. But and for good reason. But uh, yeah, I, I do remember us going to Wendy's one time and I got a little um, a bat bat. Was that his name? Bat bat? Like bat the bat. Batman parody? On Mighty Mouse. Oh yeah, yeah, Pat Pat. Like it was kind of the par- Yeah, it was kind of the parody. I I remember they did like little figurines or like suction cup figures or oh, something. Wow. So I had one of those. Um. So yeah, I I mean I watched Mighty Mouse. Um. When it was on, I didn't know what happened to get that show off the air until later. <laughs> no, okay. You know what I'm talking about, right? I don't. Tell me. Wait, you really d- – okay, so Story. Ralph Bakshi, again, this is going to be the theme of the uh, the episode, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, well. Ralph, uh, Yeah, Ralph Bakshi likes to um, – again, he likes to be in control and kind of take his own liberties. Mm-hmm. And um, he did an episode where Mighty Mouse um, – he was in a field with flowers or something like that, um, and he pulls out – he pulls out of his pocket some white powder and he sniffs it and he kind of gets very, you know, he, he, his, his superpowers are getting much more powerful. Oh, and, uh, well. the, 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 the <laughs> yeah, pretty much the, you know, the, the illusion is it's supposed to be like, um, um, the, the, the dust from like poppy seeds or something or, what, what what's the kind of um the the weird flowers that you blow on as a kid and they like fly everywhere? I want to say dandelions, but I don't think that's it. Dandelions, I, I think. I uh, we all know we we all yeah. sat in the backyard just blowing on them. Oh yeah. His excuse or his re- I'm sorry, I shouldn't say excuse because I don't have confirmation. His reason was that you know oh well he was it was like from a flower or something and um. See, it got past CBS, but it didn't get past a bunch of uh, angry mothers who saw this scene and decided that they did not want it on their TV. Well, that'll do it. That will do it. Absolutely. And I'm sure something that we're going to come across may have done it here. But So let's talk about the voice cast. Uh, we have a narrator in the form of Miles the Saxophone, and it's Keith David. Welcome to Tattertown. This is the place where everything you've ever lost winds up. Yeah. Who just weeks before this premiered in They Live. <laughs> Which, can I Can I just, I, I, oh my gosh. Absolutely. This goes, this, this kind of makes me laugh because it kind of goes back to Skip Hennant from the electric uh, company. Oh, wow. Who was on a kid's show and, uh. You know, while he was doing that, he was also uh, voicing the very X-rated Fritz the Cat. <laughs> it kind of makes me laugh. Well, they got to eat. Yeah, no, hey. Uh, nowadays, he's a Disney villain. Keith David or Skip Hinnon? Keith, D- <laughs> Keith David oh! is the voice of Dr. Facilier from The Princess and the Frog. Oh, that's right. He was. Yes. Yeah. But uh, you have Debbie. Yoo-hoo! you for running away the main human character played by sherry lynn who's got a lot of additional voices credits on imdb Mm -hmm. she's a background female voice in a lot of movies but right around this time she was on the get along gang as portia (laughs) porcupine did you watch the get along gang Uh, no just move on (laughs) i couldn't stand the get along gang i thought that they were corny (laughs) well i remember it being a thing and i remember watching it and that is all of my memory of the get along gang (laughs) yeah that's all you need no sherry lynn you know who loves the get along gang is uh jason gross of rediscovered does he i don't know i'm just i like i like kind of just accusing him of liking bad things (laughs) (laughs) hey jason I love Jason. He's my brother. I love that man. <laughs> but Sherry Lynn, probably her most notable role was Andy's mom in Toy Story. Really? Just for the first movie, though, maybe the second, but not the third. The third, it was uh, Aunt Jackie, Laurie Metcalf. Oh, 
That's right, it was! I forgot that Laurie Metcalf was in Toy Story. And okay. I had thought for a while that it was all three, and then I go back flipping through Sherry Lynn's IMDb. No, mm-hmm. she's Andy's mom first. That's it, that's true. See, they know how to be tricky. Because if yeah. you go back and watch Toy Story 3, you could be fooled that that's, that that's Jim Varney. Oh, absolutely you could. And in fact, I I, I kid you not, it, it, isn't that Sean Hunter's dad? Uh, Blake something oh i, I, I think can't you're right the same. Yeah. but i think that he came in and the reason he wanted it is because he was very close with uh jim varney so well, and go. then they were just blown away at how close it sounded so yeah they they they're they're smart about that stuff like oh, you absolutely. cannot tell then as muffet debbie's doll who's happy to escape the so-called oppression of being debbie's plaything, and immediately decides she wants to take over tattertown is mm-hmm. Jennifer Darling. I'm not just a stuffed dolly anymore. I'm my own dolly. Oh, Muffet. I gotta get out of here. It's Irma from Ninja Turtles. It is Irma. And if I remember, if I know my anime right, oh. she had a pretty big role on Tenchi Moyo. Did she? If it's the one I'm thinking of. The, uh, bo- both the girl, both the females on this show were on Tenchi Moyo. Okay, but like I, th- I think that one of them played like Tenchi's girlfriend. And to the three people who are listening, who you know were around for Tenchi Moyo, and they they'll probably appreciate that. <laughs> Hooray! Yay! <laughs> what I like about Muffet is that she's got the tough guy, squeaky New York accent. So <sighs> he drew her with stubble. Yeah, they did. And honestly, uh, Ralph Bakshi, were, and we're going to be talking, again, this is a theme of the the night, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Ralph Bakshi has, like, this weird <sighs> obsession with, like, giving characters really irritating, grating voices. Yeah, you get a lot of that in this. She, Yeah, and especially, like, with, with this character, she just, it was a little much after the first 30 seconds. Yeah. So it was just it, it was just like all right we we get it calm calm the uh, <laughs> I can't curse here calm the heck down please language it's a it's a <laughs> lot of overacting and a lot of fill this silence with just yells and screams mm-hmm. a lot of ad living is going on here oh gosh yes it's not all animated in sync but oh well no again <laughs> again just fill it but yep. And we'll get to the rest of the voices as they come in. Oh, yes. Let's get started. We immediately dive in with Keith David, the talking saxophone, setting up our entire premise with some classically painted title cards, showing Debbie her stuffed dog and Muffet being sucked into a world inside a book she found in her attic. And that's it. Yep. That's the entire setup. Thanks, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for coming tonight. 30 seconds of Debbie had so much fun playing with Muffet, but her fun, not Muffet's. Also, one day she found a strange book and they're literally dropped into Tattertown. Yep. And Debbie's first reaction isn't what just happened. It's, dog, you're alive. (laughs) Goody. Oh, boy. This is... And by the way, normally there's a point in these specials that I suggest where I, you know, we're probably halfway through, and I say this is where it kind of starts going off the handles. Uh, this was never on the handles. Yeah, there's no, there's no rails for this whatsoever. Absolutely. Like this is really, this is really where stuff starts to get absolutely insane. Which I guess is the point of Tattertown, but I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, I wouldn't argue that. No, but Muffet is much more thrilled with her new sentience and immediately cries out, I'm free! I'm not just a stuffed dolly anymore! I'm my own dolly! And between that and her running away from Debbie when she comes chasing after her with the, I've got a new dress for you to wear, they initially set Muffet up as a victim more than they do a bad guy. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I mean... Absolutely aren't the best villains origin stories morally gray well you know to be fair i mean batman dropped jack napier into that vat of chemicals and (laughs) could have prevented it could have but it's like every time i reread green eggs and ham to my kids i sympathize more and more with the other guy who's repeated over and over i don't like this i don't want this 
peer pressure. Sam I Am is the antagonist of the Green Eggs and Ham people. I absolutely. That other guy's name is Guy. Is it really? They're at it is at Universal Orlando. He's a character okay. out at Islands of Adventure, and they introduce them as Sam and Guy. That's okay. He signed his name, so it's semi official, but Again, Ralph Bakshi. <laughs> well, <laughs> so they're in Tattertown, and <laughs> Miles the saxophone gives a quick tour of the place where everything you ever lost winds up, and we pan across the town and into a lively bar where everything's alive and dancing. Uh, there is both a dancing piano and a dancing jukebox and a singer and a living brass horn playing all at the same time. Mm-hmm. And it works. Uh, there's a boxing it, it, match it going on mm-hmm. between this muscly dude and an actual boxing glove with a face. <sighs> but right in the foreground of the bar, drowning in their sorrows in what are clearly shot glasses, are early Disney and Oob Iwerks creations, Oswald mm-hmm. the Lucky Rabbit and Flip the Frog. Mm-hmm. Did you catch that line? Uh... To be honest, I'm not going to act like I'm cool. No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I, but again, I, that doesn't surprise me because Bakshi loves to take shots at Disney and everything. And we're not even we're not even done with the the Disney uh, slaps, by the way. Oh no, we're about a minute into this, and oh already you have background cameo character going. I could have <laughs> been bigger than Mickey. I could have been bigger than Mickey. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's not wrong. <laughs> no. Very few people knew who Oswald the Lucky Rabbit was when this aired. Now he's at Disneyland. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You're being serious? Yeah, they're cameos. It's like they're drawn just legally enough to get them in there, but it's clearly supposed to be them. Oswald the Lucky. Oh, <gasps> oh my God. Oh, I know who. who okay. I did not make that connection. Yeah. I 100% did not. That is the joke there. Doe. He kind of regained popularity about 10 years ago. He was in those Epic Mickey games, and they decided, all right, he's a thing. Mm. Okay. Let's make money off of him. But as far as the special goes, that was a cameo I forgot about until now. I didn't even make that connection, so I'm glad that you kind of brought that kind of to my attention. There you go. Wow. So we catch back up with Debbie chasing after Muffet, and it's when she says, Ooh, she got away again, that I realized, oh, time has passed since that opening scene. Oh. And I guess Debbie just decided, well, guess I live here now. Yup. And she doesn't really show any desire to get home at all. Nope, not at all. But then she chastises her stuffed dog, You weren't much help. As Whoa! The- as the dog whines, I'm sorry. And we hear it's Charlie Adler, the voice of Buster Bunny. I'm sorry. Yup. And? And cow and chicken and the and, big heads from Rocco's Modern Life. And? Who are you thinking of? I'm thinking of Low Light from G.I. Joe. Oh. He was on the Who, list. Who, by the way? Oh. 100% legit. That is Jason Gross's favorite G.I. Joe character. <laughs> no, that's the truth, though. But oh, um, Charlie Adler, I always uh, Charlie Adler's got one of the greatest careers in voice ab- uh, voice actor you know history. I just oh yeah, ab- he's I mean he's done it all, seen it all. He, you know he got replaced by uh, the Crypt Keeper on Tiny Toons. Um, you know so he could yeah. go and do because uh, he didn't get the uh, role in Animaniac, so he kind of just jumped to. Uh, to do, um, what is it? Um, I think it was All Real Monsters or something. Oh, yeah, something. yeah. No, he was Ickes in that, I think. Mm-hmm. Sounds about right. He's got a very recognizable voice if you're listening for it. It's like Chris Lotta, kind of. Uh, and then he'll do other random things. He was a bunch of different Transformers. Like, he was yep. Silver Bolt and Trigger Happy in the original series. Mm-hmm. And then in the Michael Bay films, he's Starscream. Starscream, yep. Uh, yep. Which, it, it's kind of funny because I was watching... Um, G.I. Joe the movie one day and my wife says to me is that John Kassir as uh, and she, you know she didn't know who Cobra Commander was she didn't give a crap about G.I. Joe as a girl okay. and I was like no that's um 
it's Chris Lotta. And mm-hmm. it's funny she said that because John Cassier took over for Charlie Adler, <laughs> and then Charlie Adler played Starscream in the movie. So I, it's one of those weird Bill Murray Lorenzo music. Yeah, things. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, Charlie Adler. I mean, it and and he loves interacting with fans on uh, Twitter. By the way, does he? Uh, so he, oh gosh, yes. Following Anytime you Charlie have, Adler. Yes, if if you ever ask him a question or you know kind of respond to one of his comments, he, he always you know he'll he'll retweet you and you know answer your question. It, he's absolutely fantastic. My two favorite Charlie Adler roles. Uh, he was the original voice of Spike the Dragon from My Little Pony in the eighties. Oh wow! Okay, and he was the Hamburglar in the eighties when they switched. Oh. Yeah, from when the Hamburglar switched from being a creepy dude with a humpy nose to a fuzzy head character. Mm-hmm. That's when he <gasps> gets the Charlie Adler voice. Wow! I didn't even notice. Yes. Oh my gosh! It was that's, that's a incredible. very retrospective thing. But if you listen to an yeah. old, like mid eighties, I think starting in eighty five, Hamburglar when he doesn't have a human face anymore. Oh, it's very I, I kind of prefer the uh, kind of the Muppet kind of yeah the, the uh, yeah that's the kind of I the the, the human Hamburglar just freaks me out. It, it just Right. Oh, Absolutely. Terrifying. And we also meet another new character, Harvey, a small teddy bear who's trying to be a tough guy like the George <sighs> of a Mice and Men archetype. Let me mm-hmm. at him. But he's got, yep. he's got the cute little child voice of actual child, Adrian Arnold. Take this and that and this and the right and the left and a- who was nine years old at the time, wasn't in much else, but he was in a couple of episodes of Wings as Tim Daly's younger self. Okay. So, Adrian yeah. Arnold. Good for you, Adrian. Hey. So Harvey's arm tears off, and as Debbie sews it back on from they're talking about Muffet and how she didn't use mm-hmm. to run away from her back in the real world. And, okay, this pops up in a lot of things. It's in Cool World, too. Mm-hmm. Why is the real world the one where everything isn't alive or without magic or whatever? Why is that world the understood real one? Mike? Yes. I don't have an answer for you. <laughs> Again, all I can sit here and say is Ralph it's Ralph Bakshi. Yeah, I feel, but, but it's not I, Ralph Bakshi exclusive. It's a lot of things where it's in like no, Captain N yeah. and Super Mario Brothers where they enter the real world where you everything know, isn't magic and things that like right. that should be the real world we live in a boring world we this do this uncool world yes pretty much okay. all right although although oh. the fake world doesn't have tommy coombs so how cool can it really be yeah you're right that's it yep. tommy's the deciding <laughs> factor because that didn't start happening until after he was born see Boom. You see, now we have our answer. <laughs> All right. Tangent accomplished. So <laughs> so Debbie's remembering happier times with Muffet and mentions, why well, I could remember when I got her for Christmas. And Harvey asks, what's a Christmas? And oh, yeah, I forgot this was supposed to be a Christmas special. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I forgot what we were doing here on my own podcast, Chad. By the way, you skipped over one tiny detail. Oh, no, What? Did we, uh, or maybe you didn't? Did we get to the point with the uh, where they're running down the street, and there is a very familiar voice that says, "If you do that again, I'll give you such a pinch." Oh, I didn't have that in the notes. Whose voice oh. is that? It's very, you know, it's funny you bring it up. It's very similar to a very, very famous mouse. Let's go searching. You do, and I'll give you such a pinch. <laughs> Did they actually get Wayne Allwine? I don't think they did. It just really, it it was, it was. But that was the gag. Yeah, it was very, very clearly supposed to sound like Mickey Mouse. And it was kind of black and whitish. So it could have been like a, you know how you said like they, they, they drew um, the other characters, you know, legally. Uh I feel like this was kind of a steamboat Willie kind of deal. Okay. But here, here's where, here's, here's what I, here's what it hit me. Is when I when I saw that scene, I was like, I I re- that's kind of a scene I specifically remember, and I feel like as a kid, I can picture myself saying that to people and thinking I was funny, and then people not finding it as funny. Oh, I did that all the time. 
I yeah, still do so, that. Yeah, well, well, welcome to the podcast. <laughs> no, um, but I, I, that's the one scene I remember seeing the most. Really? And if you go back and listen, yeah, if you go back and check it out, which I, I don't, I don't suggest, but you know, if, if you want to, you, you, you can definitely see that it's supposed to be, uh, supposed to be a certain someone. Well, there you go. But Debbie kind of scoffs at Harvey, like, <laughs> you don't know what Christmas is? You stupid. This is where I firmly decide I don't like Debbie, and I'm rooting for Muffin. I don't like any of the characters in this, I gotta be honest. Except <laughs> Keith. <laughs> You're a spoiled jerk, Debbie. Go home to Uncool World. Yeah. Debbie's argument is, with all this junk lying around, you must have seen some Christmas stuff. Mm-hmm. Dismissing the good citizens of Tattertown as junk. Mm-hmm. I see. Rude. Even Harvey calls her out on that. It's like, it ain't junk, it's family. Yeah. Don't be such a spoiled little brat. <laughs> well, Debbie decides to go searching for any signs of Christmas items while Muffet wanders into what appears to be a toy shop where a kidnapping <sighs> is taking place. Gosh. By Sydney Spider, voiced by Charlie Adler again, and... Yeah. I've been trying to take over Tad it down for years, but never like that! Speaking of Cool World, if you have seen this, this is the prototype for Nails, who is basically the exact same spider. Ooh, the wrestler? <laughs> the, My... the spider in Cool World named Nails. Oh, oh, are you... was it the, the one with the cigar? Yes. Oh, it is oh, basically the same spider. No, this was, yeah, that was Nails with an S. Ah, okay. Bossman! Bossman! Because <laughs> our nerd, because lo- anybody who listens to this show loves wrestling. <laughs> that um, then diagram's not quite a circle, but it's close. No, it's... It's close. There are enough people who are laughing, or... It's a squared circle. There... <laughs> <laughs> But here all the toys on the shelves are throwing stuff at Sydney Spider, trying to stop this kidnapping. And then Muffet wanders in and yells, get out of here. Can't you see this spider's trying to work? What? You just spent six minutes of this show trying to avoid being caught by Debbie. And now you're aiding and abetting a kidnapping? You know, again, nothing makes sense. Oh, I don't know. (laughs) I don't know. I just... Oh my gosh! Well, neither this, this is. Go ahead. Like typical kind of Ralph Bakshi stuff going on here, and uh, it's it, just make a lot of things happen for their own sake. Yeah, pretty much. And every toy in there turns to Muffin and's like, "Who are you?" <laughs> and she introduces <laughs> herself as Muffet the Merciless, and there's uh, the heel turn. Yep. Except she's, is she really turning heel by saving, uh... It's very inadvertent that she stops this kidnapping. Well, I mean, even a heel has kind of some moral. Right, and I, but this is the first sign of villainous behavior as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. And then Sydney immediately drops the doll he had abducted and convinces Muffet to follow him to the Deadster Zone. Hang out for war toys, TV sets, and other unsavory characters. Mm-hmm. Wait, did he say TV sets? He did, because those are toys, apparently. But unsavory? Well, only if you're watching this. I mean, yeah, that kind of makes sense. Television's evil. <laughs> Anything, any, I, 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 after watching this, yes, I'm in full agreement. <laughs> I'm in full agreement with you. (laughs) There is. So the Deadster Zone is the inside of a giant toy soldier on the outskirts of Tattertown with warplanes zipping around it in the sky for effect. Well, Muffet's unimpressed by the collection of animated bullets and whatnot, so she launches into this rousing new era pep talk patent style in front of a giant American flag. Mm-hmm. Is Tattertown still technically in America if it's on a different plane of existence? I think so. I think it's like opposite re- or um, alternate reality. Okay. Meanwhile, Debbie has intrigued everyone else in Tattertown enough that they're all helping search for Christmas memorabilia. And 
Harvey's the first to run into someone. It's a Christmas wreath wearing a fedora and selling cigars. Uh Uh-huh. Hey, buddy. Come here. How'd you like to buy a cigar? Uh, But Debbie is thrilled to finally see a sign of Christmas, and she's moved to tears, confusing everyone else, because if it's so great, she would be crying. I think one of them says she sprung a leak, so... Uh She tries to explain it as best as a young child can without mentioning actual baby Jesus. So as she's describing it, she's like, it's about caroling in the snow and candy canes and decorating the tree. And we get to see the Tattertown people imagining it through this thought bubble. Uh Two things about this imagination bit. One, they imagine an old man walking with a candy cane and a Christmas tree decorated with odd junk, but they actually accurately picture a red and white striped cane and a fir tree. So they've seen Christmas things despite playing dumb. They have. Let's just kind of just call it like it is. These guys are all full of shit. (laughs) And two, when Debbie describes waking up on Christmas morning and opening presents, the toys of Tattertown imagine opening a wrapped pair of giant human children hugging them. (laughs) <laughs> that part I enjoyed, because that seems to be the usual representation of what a toy values most, being loved by a child. So, Yeah, I would agree. In a sense, that that's kind of how it works. Yeah, not going to argue there. Absolutely. Well, Muffet gets wind of the planned Christmas celebration and decides to put a stop to it, because for her, Christmas is being wrapped and unwrapped and hugged and squeezed. Mm-hmm. So... Debbie was basically Elmira. Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. But I also want to point out at this point, we all can kind of see where the special is going. (laughs) Yes. So she sends two spies to investigate Tad and Wendell. Now, Wendell appears to be an old timey candlestick telephone. Sure. But he appears to be plugged into Tad. Who's got a cowboy hat and a machine gun barrel for a nose and he talks like John Wayne. Uh, Is he supposed to be like a portable power supply? You know, I I think so. I, I think you're on to something. Yeah. I thought he was a gun at first because of the nose thing going on the barrel on his Well, nose, and especially but, with the John Wayne voice. Right. Uh, but then yeah. you know, the phone is plugged into him. He's on wheels. Uh-huh. Wait a minute, what if they all kind of just merge together at some point, okay, and they man. all kind of combine They're like into like just, mm-hmm. just some discombobulated thing? But these two are yeah. connected by an extension cord. And Wendell is the more sensitive mm-hmm. pair. That's Charlie Adler's voice again here. I want you to sneak into Tattertown and find out what kind of Christmas they're planning to have. Good. And we can waste some teddy bears while we're at it. Oh, Tisk Tad, don't be so antisocial. But he stops to admire a flower as they're sneaking around Tattertown, so he's the good-hearted bad guy of the couple. Mm-hmm. So they're going to spy, while Harvey introduces Debbie to the owner of an old comic book shop, Herbert Tannenbaum. There we go. And oh boy. Christmas tree, hey, what do I know about Christmas? I'm a shopkeeper. I sell comic books. He's an old Charlie Brown style pine tree with the tropiest Jewish accent. Yup. Who? Okay, yeah, that's what you get for hiring Ralph Bakshi to create your Christmas special. Uh huh. He goes to that well often. He, he is Jewish, born in Palestine mm-hmm. even. Or what was yep. Palestine at the time. When he, it was, yeah, I was just saying, when it was Palestine. Right. Yeah. But he still goes straight for the punchline. The joke most kids won't get is Debbie wants the Jewish stereotype to be the official Tattertown Christmas tree. Right. And entices him with, there's no competition. And, ugh. Ooh, yeah, it, um. It's bad. It it did like I said. Thirty seconds in, it starts going off the rails, it's and just, it just runaway train. Yeah, the only part of this bit that holds up is the tree telling Debbie's dog not to get any funny ideas. Yeah, I'll give you that. <laughs> Pea humor is the most respectable part of this scene, Chad. Well, let me tell you, when you're, you know, let's see, I was uh, probably five or yeah, five when it first aired. That probably would have been. 
something that I would have gotten a chuckle out of. Yeah, that was the part that humor made me still laugh. make me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the now-decorated Mr. Tannenbaum, adorned with the cigar-selling wreath from before, makes Wendell feel so warm and fuzzy inside, he runs toward it, dragging Tad his power supply behind him via extension cord, and that somehow makes the pair overload with glowing electricity? I... I guess. I don't know how anything works. I... I didn't pay attention in science class, but I'm pretty <laughs> sure that's not how that works. Well, just 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 throwing it out there. Tal Burks and Tattertown. I'm guessing. Yeah. Forget it, Chad. Backshe. Tattertown. Back Backshe. <laughs> the, the pair jump into the tree's arms, and now it's got lights. Sure. It works for me. I'm not questioning it, but not for Muffet because, uh, uh-uh. as she's about to indulge on the last slice of tobacco pie, literally a pie crust filled with cigarette butts for no reason. I don't know why that joke's there. I... <sighs> just time for a gross thing. You know, I, let me let me, let me me just do a throwback. There was... I, I forgot what episode it was. It may have been American Rabbit. Okay. Again, I want to apologize for anyone where I do these... Uh, Size, and then I say nothing. I want to apologize <laughs> for doing my Tom Likas impression again, oh, and I also want to apologize for mentioning his name. But this ep- this special really just <laughs> wears everybody out big time. <laughs> I think. <sighs> there we go again. Sit tobacco pie, <laughs> tobacco pie. Who? Oh. It's just as bad as the um the American Rabbit where they uh pulled a needle out. Oh yeah, and, and tried to um then they sedated the guy. Don't do drugs, uh, kids. Yes, this is leave the gorilla he, alone. He... he already ate Garfield. Yes, my gosh, people. But Bakshi, he can't be surprised that this didn't get picked up. <laughs> no, not in 1988. Like, you could get away no. with a lot. You could get away with this much. In 95, maybe he could have gotten away with this. But maybe not in 88. If, if he was around maybe six or seven years later, he would have been just fine. I mean, this did pave the way for Ren and Stimpy. Well, yeah, and that's, and that, I mean, a lot of that had to do with because John Kay actually worked under Ralph Bakshi. And, you know, Ralph Bakshi was kind of his teacher when oh, uh, yeah. John first guy and you could see the influence right. too. i think he worked on mighty mouse yes yes okay. i think that he was one of uh he was either the animator or he was one of the uh storyboard artists i i, okay. I can't remember which one though one or the other but he, i'm sure he was miserable the entire time oh absolutely oh yeah yeah <laughs> But Muffet's about to eat this tobacco pie when she's interrupted by the delivery of a picture postcard of Tad and Wendell on the Christmas tree. Oh, so they're on Team Tattertown now, I guess. <laughs> they they drop the they they drop the big leg drop on uh, Macho Man and they join the NWL. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then we get that's to a seat. So- what? That's why they glow yellow. It was yes. Electricity. <laughs> <laughs> so then we get a scene of Sydney the spider trying on a crown and royal garment that are apparently Muffets, but we've never seen them before now. I don't know. It's a wasted joke to have Muffet just walk in on his delusions of grandeur just so she can well, yell at him for a second while he looks stupid. Yeah, but it, it, oh gosh, this whole thing feels wasted. It's, <laughs> it's a so- lot of wasted time here. That they could have there just used of, yeah. having more of those pan shots, like in the bar. That was great. Mm-hmm. But you have well, too much, like, dialogue along with it that didn't need to be there. I don't know. I don't know what's happening here. I guess they're trying to, for for the pilot, trying to set up Sydney as sort of a, I could be doing better than this. Yeah. Yeah. Perhaps. I, I Perhaps, but at the same time... I mean, I like what you said before. I kind of like the idea that a lot of, you know, the ideas later mm-hmm. were, you know, for um, Cool World. Yes. So, I, I mean, I, I think that it's very clear where 
you know, certain ideas be- were thrown out. Certain, you know, characters were then transformed into characters in Cool World, and oh gosh, but Muffet puts Sydney into a reindeer costume, complete sure. with one antler, like the Grinch's dog Max. That was a nice touch. Uh, yeah. While Muffet dresses up like Santa Claus, part of her plan to launch an air raid on Tattertown. Awesome. Their flying mechanism is a tiny fly holding up Muffet by the seat of her Santa suit. Mm-hmm. It worked. <laughs> I like. I worked. love that though. But this whole brief flying scene is just what we've been talking about this whole time. Muffet and Sydney just screaming nonsense to fill the otherwise silent scene. Yeah. And yeah. Like- and there's a lot of screaming going on. Yeah. A lot of screaming. And it's just like, yeah, this is terrific. All right. Yeah. Just. Wow. Hey, this is terrific. Wow. Ha <laughs> ha. Well, second voice acting is fun. <laughs> That's why so many of them go uh, lose their voice at the end of their careers. Oh no! <sighs> uh, Meanwhile, Debbie's trying to get some Christmas carols going, but has to stop a wooden lumberjack toy from chopping down Mister Tannenbaum. And it's clear that neither the citizens of Tattertown nor the creators of this special understand Christmas yet. Mm-hmm. So, although in Bakshi's case, I'd argue that. If he didn't, which I'm not saying that he doesn't, if he didn't understand Christmas, it would be, kind of be forgivable. Well, but, yeah. You know, um, but... Uh, but a vocally impatient Debbie still not feeling very sorry for her here. I don't either. No. Tries again in tears to explain... Christmas isn't about chopping down trees or even about gifts. It's a very special time once a year when all the people stop working and playing, yelling, or fighting. (laughs) They stop all the mistrust and all their unkind deeds for this one special day. Christmas Day. All the people stop working, eh? You ever work on Christmas, Chad? I mean, mean, I've been blessed to not work on Christmas. Oh, you're Uh, lucky. Yeah, I I know a lot of people didn't get so lucky. I've worked many a Christmas. If everyone who works in broadcasting of any kind, TV doesn't sure. just stop airing oh. stuff on Christmas, y'all. Mm-hmm. And shout out to Hollywood Video for always being open on Christmas for some reason. <laughs> My dumb idiot self who asked for Majora's Mask one Christmas but forgot to ask for the expansion packet required. Wait, what's a Majora? Say that it's, again? Uh, it's a Legend of Zelda game. For, oh, okay. Yeah, for Nintendo 64, and it required, it was so big, it needed an expansion pack for the N64. Oh, my. Well, I didn't remember to ask for that thing, so I drove about that afternoon on Christmas Day, <laughs> and Hollywood <laughs> Video is the only thing open. Look, let, let's just put this out there. When when you're, wait, weren't you in, like, college when that thing came out? Yeah, I was 20. Okay, all right, then I'll give you that. Okay, yeah. so let's just put it like this. When you get a brand new video game and, you know, on Christmas, the first – you have tunnel vision. I don't care what else you get. You can get a new car. You can get, you know, diamond ring. When you get a video game, there's nothing else that really matters that morning. Yeah. Like your your mom and your dad and, you know, your brother and sister are in the kitchen making eggs. What are you doing? Trying to get my video game to work. You're trying to get your video game to work. Seeing is anything open. And just one guy sitting in Hollywood video waiting for me, probably his only customer that day. How bad did he just want to talk to you? I talked for a bit. It was a cool guy. Oh, Oh, good for him. How's he doing? I don't know. He's back (laughs) in New Jersey. Oh. Well, and here's my other question. And here's my other thing. Yeah. Wawa's are always open on Christmas. Are they? Uh, I, I guess because I remember a couple years I would actually uh, my mom wanted me to go out and get orange juice or something and I would also want a cigarette so I was more than happy to go up to the Wawa. Yeah, so. I guess I guess the ones with gas stations are open. Gas stations are open Christmas. Yeah, uh, and they're all gas stations down here. So, oh yeah, oh, now I got to get that cranberry holiday hoagie thing. Oh, oh, you mean the the gobbler? The gobbler, yeah. Yes. New Christmas oh. tradition, y'all. 
<laughs> beautiful, beautiful. Rant over. And here comes the air raid, which, of course, uh-huh. Debbie immediately mistakes for Santa. Close, but no cigar. Until she recognizes, oh, it's Muffet. She must be bringing Christmas cheer. I oh. love you, Muffet. It's not Christmas cheer. She hasn't been dr- bringing any cheer whatsoever. Why would she think that she's going to start now? <laughs> yeah, well, it's, I don't know, blind love. But at the last second, Muffet and her entire oh. fleet are directed off course by the real Santa. Who sure has a habit in cartoons for flying over places he's apparently never seen before. Yep. Tattertown doesn't know who he is. He's crash landed on Pac-Land. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't know. I, I I think these kids in these towns are, uh, you know, they're they're getting the raw end of the deal here. When you get closer and Santa closer to light speed, it all just blurs together. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. To be fair, yeah, but Muffet decides her new target is now actual Santa and about faces straight for him. But her fleet of bombs, specifically a not very bright one who very intentionally sounds like Goofy. Mm-hmm. Mistakes that change of direction for her wanting them to attack each other. Oh, I get it. Muffet wants us to attack each other. <laughs> that Muffet is such a genius. Ah, uh, <laughs> see, so, there we go. That inadvertently causes an explosion of fireworks in the night sky. <laughs> which now the folks of Tattertown think it's part of Christmas. And aerial dogfight and fireworks, and they are sure. here for it. Oh, they're all about it. And here's another blink and you miss it cameo, but you can see a silhouette of Popeye cheering in the among the crowd here. Oh, can you? Yeah. Oh my gosh, I didn't even know. I'll have to find like a screenshot of it, but it is absolutely yeah, Popeye. Do. But it's just a shadow. It's like you know how they'll draw a silhouette of a crowd, and then it's just. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's like that. Um. The 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 uh the Superman Adventures cartoon where they like drew. Yeah. Like Stan Lee and a bunch of others, and then <laughs> yep. they had to take it out. Oh, man. So close. But, Stupid Marvel. Yeah, well. But Debbie makes one last attempt to get it right for herself, so she finds an old gramophone that just so happens to be loaded up with Bing Crosby singing White Christmas. If this doesn't play, I give up. Of a white and that does it. That we see a montage of Tattertown finally sure. understanding the meaning of Christmas and getting into this loving Christmas spirit. Another quick cameo here of Bosco and Honey kissing underneath a heart shaped uh, moon. Hey y'all. Sure. Uh you know, probably not the best idea to include Bosco in a cartoon now, but you know, at that yeah, time, well, I is. think that Nickelodeon and Nick at, or did Nick at Night come out at that time? Yeah, Nick at Night was I, out around now. Okay, so I think there was a good five, six, seven year period where they were showing Bosco cartoons at like really late at night, early in the morning. Well, so and Bosco does, and Honey showed up on Tiny Toons later. They did a whole Field of Dreams parody to try and get Honey back. Did they really? Yeah. It was an episode where it was like Babs didn't have an older counterpart. Buster has bugs. Mm, uh Babs is like, who can I? And she digs up into the vault and finds Honey. Okay. And it's a whole Field of Dreams parody where someone's whispering to her to build a movie theater. I had forgotten about that. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Voiced by BJ Ward, a.k.a. Scarlet from G.I. Joe. Uh, really? Honey was apparently, yeah, apparently in Tiny Toons, that was um, huh. that was who it was. For like wow. a line and a half, but hey, we'll take it. Well, yeah. Hey, oh, wow. Okay. But Bosco and Honey are seen kissing, and everybody's just, tears are flowing down everyone's cheeks even Sydney and the fly henchmen are moved to tears as they buck Muffet off by the way I gotta I got to tell you when Ralph Bakshi draws cartoons crying I, I just get so much more irritated <laughs> just there's just something about the way he, he shows these uh, characters crying that just trying to oh, just, just gets me more angry <laughs> They're kind of like leaking out of their face, but it's not a constant Ugh. drip. It's just, it's like a faucet that's not quite kind of. turned off. No, yeah, I would, uh, yeah, it's 
like the one in my bathroom that I need to fix. <laughs> womp womp. Womp womp. They buck Muffet off and send her flying straight into a jailhouse. Good. Where Debbie happily showers her with wrapped gifts, causing even Muffet to cry momentarily as well, before she realizes she's been caught. Uh-huh. So she's locked up, and Sydney sends us home by dumping boxes of powdered soap from the sky to create snow. Oh, look at that. Just like every theme park in Florida. Oh, is that what they do? It's soap. Oh, Good I didn't know that. Good old snope. How do they clean that? How does... does What? How did... Oh, gosh. I don't even want to know how they clean it up. I don't either. (laughs) A lot of it just... Well, I mean, for Disney, they don't do it to a point where it sticks. It's just falling. Oh, okay. But over in the town of Celebration, actual name of a town, they line the streets with snow and they have it falling so the kids can go and play. My kids have made soap angels. Wow, really? Yeah. Yeah. And that wow. is the only snow they've ever seen. Uh, oh, my we'll goodness. We'll fix that eventually. Sure. But, uh, and then these last scenes finally give us the snow-covered, Christmassy-looking Tattertown. Just in time for our saxophone narrator to tell us that about sums up our Christmas gig, and, mm-hmm. and that's it. Yeah. We made it. <laughs> we, 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 it, it, it took a long time. Uh, emotionally and physically, but we got there. <laughs> we did. <laughs> Any final thoughts about Christmas in Tattertown? Uh, not that I can say over the air. Don't well. <laughs> um, no, you know what? And I, it, this is not my favorite, you know, Ralph Bakshi creation. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, it's not, you know, Hey, good looking where I just, I, I never want to ever see it again. <laughs> um, I think that there is some, promise with these characters and idea yeah. i can see it kind of being integrated into you know a later nickelodeon you know nicktoons kind of era i could mm-hmm. see it being on nick at night um it was just i i don't want to say it was ahead of its time i think it was just too early to consider this being a good uh, you know a nick nickelodeon product i i just it, it's it's not awful, but it, it, if you know Ralph Bakshi's creations, it he, I, I go back and forth with it. I really do. Yeah. Um, I just love how the synopsis on Wikipedia ends. While the residents did consider White Christmas to be a beautiful song, it is never resolved whether anyone ever grasped the true meaning of Christmas. Well, yeah, it makes sense because, you know, this was meant to be, you know, a series and I'm sure that it would have, you know, continued. Maybe they would have even done it like every year. No, I mean, I know that it says like, thir- it, you know, they were promised what? 39 episodes, I guess. 39. But what if they were, is that what I read? I, the number 39 stands out and, and uh, maybe I'm misquoting this. I'm thinking of that as a lot, but I'm probably thinking this is Nickelodeon. They have five day weeks to fill. Yeah. And not yeah. just Saturday morning. So 39 makes more sense there. I mean, and if you think about it, like a filmation season would have been like what? You know, 64. 60, yeah. You know, so I mean, that that kind of makes sense. There you go. Um, let's see. Uh, 39 episodes. Yeah. Okay. It was well, originally the series was to be picked up in 1989 for 39 episodes, but the, the project was abandoned. And quite frankly, it's probably best. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and then Nickelodeon wouldn't get its own original cartoon until Doug. Doug was the first one. Doug huh? was the first series. Yeah. They had this was okay. the first animated anything, and then they had that Thanksgiving spectacular oh, oh, the year Mike. after in eighty nine. Oh Mike. Oh that that Thanksgiving spectacular oh. Oh yeah. We'll oh do that one Thanksgiving. Maybe next oh. Thanksgiving we'll set some time to do that. Mike. Oh that Thanksgiving special. <laughs> oh there's 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 just there, we would have to do a well Mike, we would have to do a a a, a it would have to be a mini series. Oh, really? that thing is so gorgeous. I okay. oh, everything about that is beautiful. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> well, Chad, 
If people want to decorate you with a cigar smoking wreath, where can they find you on the internet? Uh, assuming I haven't changed my uh, <laughs> my Twitter handle, it's happened. Uh, and uh, you can find me uh, Twitter, Instagram, and on Facebook at Horror Movie Barbecue Podcast. Is um, I, I try to do at least like one podcast a month. Uh, so hopefully, I'm assuming by Christmas, I'll probably have done you know one podcast a month. You can also find. Um, uh, the TPIF podcast with my buddies Derek and um, Tommy uh, TC Coombs. Uh, find it in iTunes um, and, of course, horrormoviebarbecue.com, my beloved baby of a blog. Yes. Do all those things. Show notes for this podcast are at adventcalendar.house, on Twitter at adventcalhouse. Thank you, Chad. I'm glad you brought up this one. I, You know what? I am, too. I, I really had a fun time discussing this Good. with you. Thank you, Mike. So... For Chad Young from the Hangout of Unsavory TV sets, careful of the icy patch. Or I'll give you such a pinch! Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha! It's the season, my love so. Holly tinsel, mistletoe. When you see them, then you'll know it's Christmas! So we catch back up with Debbie chasing after Muppet. Muppet. <laughs> so we catch. Yep. Yeah. I so wish there were Muppets in this. <laughs> I kept typing Muppet as I was doing these notes, so. We also left out one voice actor. Did we? Uh, Yes, providing uh, some background voices from uh, people may know him from G.I. Joe. uh, Arthur Burkhart, who played Destro. And um, the reason I bring this up is because I have a great Arthur Burkhart story for you. Oh. And I think you'll appreciate this. Lay on me. Okay, so I was at Transformers, uh, I'm sorry, TFCon in Canada two years ago. Okay. With uh, my buddy JD of, um, of uh, General Geekery. And, uh, you know, we're walking around the hotel Friday night, you know, going to the bar, and Arthur Burghardt just flew in, and we're talking to him, and, you know, and we're just like, hey, you know, Arthur, you're one of our, you know, one of our favorite voice actors. And he says to me very sternly, my boy, I am an actor. Not a voice actor. <laughs> I'm like, well, okay, all right. I I, I completely respect that. You're and, not wrong. You no, know, it's a pleasure to meet you. The next day is where it really gets fun. Uh, Michael Bell, who I mean, it, 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 there's not just one voice I can you know list him as. Everyone knows who Michael Bell is. Yes, yeah. I was just talking about Michael Bell. Um, he was the voice of Opus the Penguin in a yes. Wish for Wings that Work. Yes. Um. I, I, you know, he's signing autographs. Arthur is taking his time and kind of shows up late. I'm in, um, I'm talking to JD in line about, you know, and we're, we're just joking around and we're talking to someone, you know, next to us. I don't even know who it was. And we're telling him this story. Well, I, I, I don't know if you could tell, but I have a very loud voice. And Michael Bell overheard me say, you know, this thing about <laughs> Arthur and he yells, he did not say that. Oh, flippity gibbet. Him. He's a flippity gibbet. Voice actor. <laughs> and everybody in line just belts out laughing. <laughs> and it was the greatest <laughs> thing ever that I've. And if I could have had that on video, like that would have been the greatest thing ever. <laughs> because I guess oh, Arthur wow. kind of has uh, a reputation for being a little gruff. And a little <laughs> angry and kind of difficult to work with. And to see Michael kind of uh, react that way was just the highlight of my weekend. <laughs> That's my new favorite story. And, and oh my gosh, it was it was so good. It was so good. <laughs> it's Christmas. The Advent Calendar House is part of the Christmas Podcast Network, located conveniently at ChristmasPodcastNetwork.com. <laughs> Oh, hello there. I didn't see you come in, which is odd because I set up this microphone just to record. I'm Tim Babb from the Can't Wait for Christmas podcast, and I'd like to invite you to join us every month as we talk about the traditions, the music, the movies, the food, and the fun of the merriest holiday on Earth. 
Plus, you'll help us answer some questions like, what is the greatest version of Jingle Bells? Bing Crosby. Is Die Hard a Christmas movie? Yes. What is the best Christmas food? Well, everybody knows that one. Hey. <laughs> Imaginary listener, it sounds kind of like Kermit the Frog. Can you be quiet? If you give away all the answers, they're not going to listen to the show. All oh, right. Sorry. Anyway, that's the Can't Wait for Christmas podcast. New episodes on the 25th of every month, wherever you get your podcasts, or at Can't Wait for Christmas Pod. Next time on the Advent Calendar House. Sesame Street and the Hobsom Sum present Shalom Sesame!